got got all of my devices going. Um, yeah, so welcome to another week in space uh, into my astro parlor. And uh, every Monday at this time, I like to uh, get us all together to talk about what's going down in the celestial spheres for the week to help you prepare uh, to see if you need to bring an umbrella or a value <laughs> for uh, for the week. Um, we got some exciting stuff going on this week. I'll just uh, let people arrive and settle in. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in. Um, and uh, just to let folks know that uh, I do this through the Astro Star Live app, which is a uh, great uh, astrological community, which uh, has a lot of really great stuff going on uh, and a bunch of fantastic astrologers who are dra dropping some excellent astro knowledge on a regular basis. People like Tara Atal, Sam Reynolds, Michael Bartlett, uh, Richard, I can never remember Richard's last name, um, but Richard's great. Anyway, uh, if if you're interested in getting down with a great astrological community and um, getting some uh, pretty excellent wisdom from a bunch of different astrologers who are working in uh, different areas of the art and science, I uh, suggest checking out the Astro Star Live app. It is a free download. You can get it wherever you get your apps at. And um, yeah, you can get readings from astrologers through that app, like myself, or like some pretty excellent astrologers who all be like giving talks at Norwak and are like pretty like up there in the astrological world. And the app is unique because um, it is it uh, provides live streaming, right? So um, I'm doing this through the app. And also you can book your readings through the app. You can like be in contact with the astrologers. Yeah, what's up, Jeff? Good morning. Good to see you, my friend. Um, yeah, uh, Cosmic Cousins is also up there, Jeff, uh, Hinshaw, um, I don't know if Jeff is a, uh, advisor yet, but I hope he is because, uh, their work is great. Anyway, um, that was like just allowing people to settle in, uh, dropping some, some of the, uh, news from our sponsors and, uh, in a moment, um, we'll get into the astro weather just as soon as I crack my, my, uh, mate beverage. Um, yeah, how's everybody doing out there in the tubes of the internet today? Great. All right. So, uh, yeah, we're about four past the hour. I feel like this is a, as good a time as any to, uh, start talking about what we're talking about. Um, okay. So to today, Monday, March the 18th, good morning, seven. Oh, good morning, Gina Maria. Um, oh yeah, Gina Maria says, yeah, uh, sorry about that. Um, we're still like working out the time change because like half the world or most of the world doesn't uh, do a time change and America does for whatever reason. Um, and so uh, we're still kind of like figuring it out with the time change, but I'm glad that you're here. And I hope that the time change hasn't disrupted everybody's life too, too much. Um, okay, let's uh, jump into the astrology. Good morning, Seven. Um, okay, Monday, March the 18th, Mercury enters their shadow phase at 15 degrees and 59 arc minutes of Aries. Dun, dun, dun. This means that Mercury is moving towards their retrograde. The shadow phase, uh, just for those, those of y'all who don't know, um, is the period of time when a planet, in this case Mercury, uh, hits the degree, um, in their sort of uh, progression through the zodiac they hit the degree which is where they will return to at the end of their retrograde so um uh let's see here at uh on april 25th when mercury ends their retrograde uh they will end up at 15 degrees and 59 arc minutes of aries and so uh starting today uh uh, you know, we are kind of entering into the space in space that Mercury is going to go back over during their retrograde journey through Aries. And that retrograde kicks off on April Fool's Day. Seriously, though, it does happen on April Fool's Day um, at 27 degrees and 13 arc minutes. 
And so that space between uh, like 16 degrees and 27 degrees um, is the area that Mercury is going to be uh, revisiting, rethinking, reconsidering, reimagining. Um, and so as we enter into the, well, first off, <clears throat> I just want to say, uh, you know, Mercury retrograde has its annoyances, it has its quirks, it has its... Um, uh unique um picadillos as they say um but you know it's i think that um popular culture has sort of like raised this thing up and made a huge deal about it um and you know while i think it's great to take precautions around you know our activities like travel like i don't know um buying expensive things like signing contracts etc um Yes, Jeff, Mercury does enter into their shadow today. Um, uh, so, yeah, beware. But I think that um, uh, I think that there has been a lot made of Mercury retrograde because it's something that happens repeatedly. Right. And it's something that we can point to and be like, that's the thing that did this to me, um, which, you know, I think has its benefit. Um, but I don't think, you know. I, I it's not something that I would like freak out about or like change your life about or be like oh Mercury's in its shadow like I have to go get a bunch of like uh dried food right in case all the power goes out um you know what I'm saying like it's something to pay attention to but I don't think it's something to like uh bend our lives around um and Chris Warnock who I really like he's a astrological magician um, I saw a talk with him uh, through a conference or something like that. And he was like, you know what, in and like he's pretty hardcore, but he was like in in the past, we had malefic planets. Right. And malefic planets did like the dirty. Right. They were they were doing all the difficult stuff um, and they were really hard and they would really screw up your life. And we've, uh, you know, since the development of like psychological astrology, evolutionary astrology, um, malefic planets uh are not like just bad anymore right um and we have a more nuanced and complex understanding of the malefics and so um he's like that malefic energy's got to go somewhere so we everyone just put it into mercury retrograde and then mercury retrograde wasn't enough to contain it and so we now now we have to like do mercury's shadow right and extend this kind of malefic period and that's kind of the way that it's talked about or thought about is as a malefic period um where everybody's got to be on guard and like nothing's going to work out and i don't really think that's the case like you know real talk sometimes it gets hard right the one in virgo last year like really messed me up and also the one in taurus you know but you know, um i think that uh that it what it does is bring awareness to the speed at which we act in which the the world um engages right and we live in such a fast paced society where we're supposed to be available 24 hours a day 7 days a week to respond to emails text messages dms uh you name it snapchats um that anytime there's a hiccup or a glitch um everything kind of like uh there's a schism that happens right and so anytime we need to slow down um it throws a monkey wrench into the system and there can be a lot of guilt and shame about that uh internally and from external sources and i think that um one of the things that Mercury does in that retrograde is asks us to slow down and asks us to reconsider what we're doing and why, right? <laughs> yeah, Leslie says I think the the Mercury retrograde shadows are BS, and you know I think uh, to some extent you're right. Um, what what I do think is helpful is thinking about what the container right of this space is you know what are the degrees that are going to be revisited and rethought and you know it's not like oh everything that we do from today onward we're going to have to redo um but i think that it provides an interesting context for a container and um oh man i had a great thing to say and then i forgot about it hopefully hopefully that'll come back up um but yeah oh that's what I was going to say. Uh, as Mercury retrogrades, they slow down, right? They come closer to the Earth and they move slower. And because Mercury is so quick and they're just like bouncing around planet to planet to planet, like um, aspect to aspect, like spending like a day, half a day, right? They're just they're just cruising through. 
when they slow down, they have much more of an opportunity to kind of churn things up. Right. And Mercury is our thought processes. It is the way that we uh, process information. It's the way that we connect the dots. It is the way that um, uh, we communicate. Right. And as it slows down, uh, things that usually happen quickly uh, take a little longer. Right. And need to be rethought. Right. Or maybe come back and bounce back to us. And I think that it's interesting to consider, um, you know, what it is to have a relationship with something that's very quick when it moves slowly, right? And things that we're used to happening at a certain pace when they need to slow down. Um, and, you know, as Mercury kind of gets closer and all up in our face, it becomes distracting and a little disorienting. And so, you know, as we move into this uh, shadow period, we can start to prepare ourselves. Um, yeah, uh, Leslie, you're saying the uh, retrograde itself uh, is the container. And that's true, right? But the, we're also looking at these are like Mercury sort of entering the degrees that they're going to retrograde back to. So we can also like think about maybe this is like if the Mercury retrograde is the cup, this is sort of the saucer that's holding the cup, right? And this is also like the planet beginning to slow down, right? As they are moving towards that retrograde, uh, that retrograde station, or they're slowing down in a more noticeable way. Um, but yeah, I think that it it sort of uh, definitely has been like a circle drawn around a thing that already has a meaning. Um, but I don't know. It's also like we're talking about it in the collective. It's something that has been um, introduced into the collective consciousness. And so I think it's also important to address and consider because um, this is now part of our collective mythos. Um Okay, so anyway, I just wanted to start off with that. So happy Mercury Shadow Day. <laughs> Um, and again, just the dates of the Mercury retrograde, uh, stations retrograde at 27 degrees, 13 minutes on April 1st, and they are retrograde until April 25th when they station direct at 15 degrees and 59 minutes. Oh, I also want to name that this 15 degrees, 59 minutes, or basically 16 degrees is very close, if not ex like pretty exact, like, you know, just couple minutes away from the point where Mercury, uh, sorry, where uh, Chiron and the North Node have their conjunction, which I think is one of the bigger transits that we experienced this year. And Mercury's retrograde is going to reactivate that, right? Their, their shadow begins on that point. Their retrograde ends on that point, right? Same thing. Um, but also um, they are going to con uh, conjunct the North Node three times during the retrograde and Chiron three times during the retrograde. And so that kind of Chiron North Node energy of pulling us towards our healing process, right, and really needing to examine um, our core wounding um, and the how we shift our stories around this wounding um, and uh, how we shift our stories around our healing as well, um, those are going to be really up over the next several weeks. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little later because Mercury is also conjunct to Chiron this week. But, you know, I think that that's also um, an interesting piece around this retrograde that I've been thinking about. So Tuesday, March the 19th, the sun moves into Aries. Um, this happens at 8.06 p.m. Pacific time, making that 11.06 p.m. Eastern time. And I touched on this <clears throat> at the end of uh, last week's talk um, because uh, it was a slow week in space, uh, which was very welcome. Um, but uh, this marks the spring equinox. Um, and this is the beginning of springtime. This also marks the beginning of Aries season. Um, the cardinal points, that's Aries, Libra, uh, uh, Capricorn, and Cancer, um, mark the equinoxes with uh, Aries and Libra, and uh, the solstices with Capricorn and Cancer. And so these cardinal signs, when we move into a cardinal sign, there is a shift, right? There is a new energy, and that cardinal energy is like, yo, I'm going for it, right? Let me at it. I'm here. Put me in, coach. Right. It is beginning. It is initiating energy. And so we are moving into the initiating energy of spring. Right. And this is uh, sort of the returning of the light in, in a new way. Like um, we start with the 
balance point of the equinox, the equal night and equal day. Um, and <clears throat> I think this is always um, a very interesting moment, right? We get this sort of one breath, right? Where the light and dark forces are equivalent, right? Where there is a truce called, right? Where things are in balance, where the tilt of the earth is just so. And apparently you can uh, balance an egg on its tip um, on this day. And maybe I'll try that. <laughs> but, you know, we uh, have this sort of moment of balance and harmony before the uh, Fortuna spins the wheel and things shift again, right? Before um, the, in the Northern Hemisphere, the night decreases and the day increases. And, you know, I... I think it's interesting to like rest at that moment, right? And to think about the balance in the self, right? What might what might be asking to be brought into better balance or homeostasis, right? What might be out of balance um, and thinking about the balance in the world and the things that we find out of balance and what it's like to harmonize those. Also, like, I don't know, balance is sort of revered and honored, but like maybe things that are out of balance or asymmetrical are also um, part of a greater balance. Um, and to just think about what our relationship to balance and harmony is um, and to the uh, day parts and the night parts of the self, right? The day parts and the night parts of the consciousness. And to take a moment and like rest in that as we are moving to this like um, equilibrium point where we like hit the stasis for a second and then like the wheel shifts and we're back in it, right? And the day increases in the Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> and so as we move into the increased day, you know, all of these themes of sort of rebirth um, come about. We get this. Um, with the Easter holiday, which happens in a little while, um, we get this with Ostara, right? Um, we get the uh, sort of uh, energy that has been laying latent, right? Dormant under the earth coming back and like forcing its way through the surface. Um, and I think this is a lot of um, that Aries energy, right? We have this kind of like rebirth idea, um, of like, oh, the things that are born again, right? Like uh, coming back, the spring coming back, um, life coming back, energy coming back. Um, and also uh, I think that a lot of that is not a passive process. And that's what Aries teaches us is that um, to be born again or to be reborn or to be born in general, like it's a struggle, it's a fight, right? If we think about like a little seed that needs to like force its way through the seed pod, right? And then force its way up through the surface of the earth, like all the energy that it takes to bust through the crust of the earth, right? Um, you know, it is a energetic act. And in some ways, it's a pretty violent act. Um, and, you know, I think that is some of the uh, energy of Aries, which is like bursting forth on the scene and like needing to like really fight um, for its place in the world. And that is kind of the energy that comes online with uh, Aries season. And um, with Aries season, we move into the uh, first decan of Aries. Um, and uh, this is sort of symbolized by a battle axe, um, or Austin Kopic talks about it as a battle axe. And then uh, some of the other older texts um, talk about it as a like dark person, dark man carrying a sword or a weapon with like red eyes. <laughs> like it's pretty ominous imagery. Especially when we're like, oh, it's spring, right? It's new life. And the kind of image associated with the Deccan is like a dark looming figure carrying a weapon with like red beady eyes. And um, just so folks know, if you're not aware, the Deccans um, are a system of rulership um, or of dignity uh, that each sign is broken up into three segments of 10 degrees. Um, and each of these uh, 10 degree segments has like a different kind of spirit that is associated with a different energy um, and a different planet ruling it. The first decan of Aries is ruled by Mars. So we also have this double Mars energy that we are moving into. Um, so again, like this force and this fight and this kind of desire to live, right? And, you know, this Deccan is this like Deccan associated with the battle axe is kind of uh, talked about as separating. 
right? And Marlena Seven Bremner um, has done a lot of work on the Deccans. She just finished her Deccan walk. And a Deccan walk is like going through each of the Deccans, um, you know, acknowledging them uh, throughout the year. I think I'm going to start my own, which I'm a little excited about. But anywho, uh, Marlena Seven Bremner has done a lot of uh, work on her Patreon about the Deccans. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, check her out um, on Patreon. And I think it's like a dollar to get um, access to all of them. And um, her work is like really, really great and has um, informed the way that I think about the sky in really amazing ways. Um, but, you know, uh, with this sort of like battle axe energy, there is a separation, right? Um, and I think that that's part of the like individuation process that Aries also calls for, right? Which is separating from the seed pod, right? Or separating from the like um, snuggly nestly place of the earth, the separating from the all is one everything, right? And like choosing or being forced to burst through the surface, right? Separating from the womb, right? And being uh, coming out into this uh, really cool world that we have here. <laughs> And being like, I am here, right? I am an individual uh, being and then having the umbilical cord cut, right? And that is that separation from the all, from the womb, from the mother, from the uh, seed pod, from the everything, um, where we are now on our individu individual quest um, by ourselves, right? And the, you know, battle axe um, or the axe of the uh, first decan of Aries is this like separating force that's like, okay, what what was before is no longer and now it's just you kid good luck right and here's this tool right here's this battle axe here's this um uh tool to separate here's this tool to create go make your way in the world um which is like that's pretty intense right and that's the energy that we are coming into and this card is associated with the uh two of wands which t susan chang talks a lot about uh in uh the 36 secrets um which is a book on the decans and the tarot um and the two of wands sort of this person looking out over the the land looking at the map and this is sort of like preparing for the adventure right like i'm showing up on the scene and like let's go right and like aries is always down to go it's like what do you want to do let's do it right like Oh, let's go over there. Let's like break into that thing and check it out. Okay, let's go over there. Let's do this, right? And so I think that this um, kind of energy of the first decan of Aries, the very beginning is like arriving on the scene and being like, where is the adventure, right? Waiting for the call to adventure. Yeah, uh, I got a fire emoji from uh, the brilliant Lauren K. Hickman, who is one of my favorite Aries out there. Um, happy almost birthday, my friend. Um, right, so I think it's this... Uh, kind of like arriving on the scene, separating from what was being like, it's like fresh, so fresh and so clean, clean, right? So like ready to go, like, let's do this. Where, okay, where are we going, <laughs> right? What, like, what is the quest? Where is the call to adventure? And so as we move into this uh, um, kind of like moment of rebirth, also this moment of separation, um, this moment of standing on our own, um, I would say like listen for the call to adventure right and uh you know i think that it's out there and that can look a lot of different ways and that could be oh i'm out of milk i need to go to the store that is the call to adventure it could be oh i need to like go to a foreign country or i have to go take care of an uh uh aging parent or i need to get a pet right the call to adventure can look many different ways but i think with this like cardinal aries energy um with this rebirthing with this like uh battle axe that's like separating from what was and um asking us to step into what can be um pay attention for what the universe um or your deep mind might be asking right and uh the ways that we are maybe being asked to step up or step into something new um <laughs> somebody asked uh since it's airy season are we supposed to embrace being selfish and childish um maybe we could uh reframe that a little bit and uh say since it's airy season um we are being asked to uh, fo uh focus on what our needs might be right to center ourselves 
um, and to uh, come into an alignment with ourselves and like what our course of what uh, right action might look like for us. And we get to do that in a very playful way, right? With the child mind. How is that, right? Maintaining the child mind as we like come into a lot al better alignment with ourselves. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so he says, uh, I may be a Taurus, but I will always stay out of an Aries way. That's what's up. But okay, like being a Taurus, uh, if Aries like starts a thing and you follow them, they're going to get burned out pretty quick. And then you're going to pick it up and be like, you know what? Like, I'm going to keep doing this, right? This quest that you initiated, I'm going to stick with this. <laughs> As like Aries goes on to something else, like you'll probably be left holding the bag and like completing that quest. And that is the fixed sign energy that follows the um, initiating energy of the cardinal signs. Uh, yeah, Aries are just faster Tauruses. So um, how are we doing? Great. Okay, uh, moving on to Wednesday, March the 20th. Okay, yeah, Gina Maria says, I'm in that space. Let's go. Hell yeah. Yeah, Gina Maria. Um, okay, so uh, moving right along. On Wednesday, March the 20th, um, we have Mercury conjunct Chiron and Aries at 18 degrees and 18 minutes. Um, and so this is the first of a series of three uh, conjunctions between Mercury and Chiron that are occurring in Aries um, because of the retrograde. So um, we have this one happening on Wednesday, March the 20th. On April the 15th, uh, Mercury will conjunct Chiron again at 20, 20 degrees of Aries. And this is right near the eclipse point, which happens, uh, the eclipse is happening at 19 degrees. Um, and that uh, uh, the eclipse is happening at 19 degrees on April 8th, I believe. Um, and uh yeah so like a week earlier and then the third conjunction will be happening on may 7th at 21 degrees of aries also close to the eclipse point at 19 degrees and i also want to point out that uh america's natal chiron is at 20 degrees of aries thank you leslie yeah april 8th is the total solar eclipse that is going to cross america that's going to be conjunct chiron um, and then Mercury will retrograde back and uh, conjunct Chiron just a degree later, um, about a week after. And this is all kind of conjunct America's natal Chiron, which is, um, I imagine, going to bring up some core wounding, which I think is already getting uh, kind of uh, churned up. And, and the fiery rhetoric of... Uh, Mercury in Aries is being um, sort of activated uh, with the run up to the presidential election in America and uh, the snippets of news that I catch are like, whoa, this is getting like extra unhinged. Um, and I don't really want to go there, but, you know, the news is an um, interesting way of being like, oh, yeah, that's how that's playing out. That's interesting and kind of uh, funny and absurd and sometimes terrifying. So... <clears throat> I just wanted to bring this in because we're entering, as we enter into the shadow phase, uh, whether it's nonsense or not, we're also entering into the series of conjunctions with Chiron and Mercury conjunct the North Node, um, which I think is going to bring up a bunch of stuff. Chiron is the archetype of the wounded healer, right? And... Um, I think it has a lot to do with the story, this relationship, Mercury and Chiron, I think it has a, a lot to do with um, the stories that we tell ourselves, right, around, um, around our wounds, right, around the feelings that we are having and how the feelings that we are having motivate uh, our speech, our thoughts, our actions, right? And so I think that this conjunction gives us an opportunity, Mercury and Chiron gives us an opportunity to learn more about our core wounding or our wounds or what our wounds might have to say to us, right? Because like something happens, we get hurt, right? Um, we sort of like crawl into our Chiron cave and we uh, suffer about it, right? That is kind of the story of Chiron. He gets hit with uh, a poison arrow from Hercules's bow, 
and he can't heal it and he crawls into his cave and he suffers on it right and then like sometimes it gets better sometimes it gets worse but it's like uh damaging right and part of the pain of this is the story that is retold about like oh that thing happened and that sucked and i hate that person now right and like why did this happen to me this is so unfair <clears throat> these are sort of chiron narratives this is unfair right why did this happen i can't go on this sucks right and these are stories that we're telling you know and um i think i've talked on on about the uh, parable of the two arrows on on this before but basically it's like the first arrow is the wound right the thing that happens uh hercules's arrow hitting chiron in the thigh and then the second arrow is when we're replaying that event over and over and over and over and over again and continuing to like re-wound ourselves right and i think that uh, mercury the messenger or kind of capacity for making connections and telling stories comes in and it's like okay like what is what's the story that we're telling here chiron like okay like that's it like is that the story that you want to tell and so right again um we're going to get this sort of uh they're going to have this conjunction and then their uh mercury is going to pass by and then retrograde have this conjunction again and then pass by and then have this conjunction again and so in these relationships, what tends to happen is we have an activating event, right? That conjunction where it's like something comes to light, right? That can be a little destabilizing. And then there will be the retrograde where it's like rethinking, revisiting, reconsidering. And then the third pass is, uh, tends to be a final integration. So this week, some stuff around our core wounding might be coming up, right? Or there's an opportunity to be in better communication with the places in ourselves that or maybe uh, not feeling so great, right? Or maybe uh, carrying some pain and suffering from the past. Um, and I think it's uh, helpful to identify the ways in which these wounds play out in our lives, right? And the ways that they motivate our actions and our thoughts. Um, and it's an opportunity to open communication with the wounded and neglected parts of ourselves. And through kind of a parts work lens, right, we can think about uh, the parts that are wounded, right, that are carrying this core wound, whether it's from, you know, family of origin or um, uh, fucking systemic uh, oppression or a breakup or, you know, you broke your arm or whatever, right, whatever um, the activating event or like whatever the um, cause of the wound is, right, it is um, activating a like a part in ourself or like a younger part is carrying this right because it hasn't been healed or integrated this is a way of thinking about it right and i think that this transit with mercury um who is the messenger who goes between the olympian right the higher realms the middle earth which is maybe our cognitive functions and then the lower realms which is maybe the somatic or the underworld um, mercury gives us an opportunity to um, communicate with these wounded parts and ask them hey what's going on here right um what do you need right is there anything that i can do to help ease this and this brings up um, the myth of the Fisher King, which is another kind of Chiron myth, um, where Parsifal, who is the young fool, which could be Mercury, right, the eternal child, the uh, Puer Eternus, comes to the old king who is wounded and suffering and needs to ask the question, what ails thee to be able to heal the Grail King and to be able to heal the uh, lands? Right. And I think this question, hey, what's the matter? Right. Um, is is the key to unlocking a lot of this Chiron wounding and uh, the key to healing a lot of it, because I think what happens is there is a activating event. There is a wound. Right. Whether it's a breakup or, you know, parents divorce or um, I don't know, could be anything right? Um, the death of a loved one, the death of a pet, right? And we carry this, right? And it's sort of like in our system somewhere and it gets reactivated through, you know, a song on the radio or any constellation of events and it comes up and it sort of takes the, takes the uh, uh, wheel, right? And like um, uh, sort of throws us in the passenger seat and starts driving the bus for a minute. And uh, we're, the way that I kind of respond to this is just being like, get out of here, shut up. Like, that's so dumb. We've got to keep working. We don't have time for this, right? I've got this uh, report to do, right? Um, instead, 
And another way that we could address this is uh, making a little space and listening and being like, oh, whoa, you're here. Hey, what's what's going on? What do you need anything? What ails you, my friend? How can how can I be of service? Right. And being able to open lines of communication to the parts of us that are carrying uh, this wound. Right. Um, because I think that this part is just on a its own loop, which is like, this is so unfair. This sucks. I hate this. I don't want to be here. Right. Or whatever that story, that narrative that's playing is. And us, we're just going about our lives being like, OK, got to go to work, got to do the thing, got to do the dishes, got to go to work. Right. While this sort of uh, loop of like, this sucks, I hate this is going in the background. And again, I think Mercury comes in the messenger and uh, gives a little space to be like, whoa, what can let's examine this story a little bit, right? Can we open this up? What's a different story that we could tell here? You know, um, and I think that having a lot of curiosity, right, just about what is sort of coming up in the system, what is coming up in our internal dialogue, what is coming up with that inner critic, right? What is coming up with uh, whatever stories we are telling about um, our experiences and if we have the space or the capacity to be like, whoa, where is this coming from? Is this actually the story that I want to be telling? Is this story actually accurate? Right. And I think that um, Mercury and being curious about Mercury um, or curiosity with Mercury gives us the opportunity to kind of address old wounds and to uh, understand new remedies, right? Because instead of like just going in this loop, the whole time mercury um with this curiosity can be like whoa what else might be there right and it gives us uh maybe a broader perspective to look around to see what uh kind of uh remedies might be growing right there and i think this is one of the things with chiron as well is that um as the wounded healer the poison is often the cure right just in the right dose um, and so I think Mercury can help uh, kind of tease things out and tell a different story or look at a different perspective of a situation um, that might help us to find, oh, wow, like there's actually help that's right there. Or there is something that I can do that is available that might help to ease kind of the suffering of this experience. Um, Sorry, I'm just um, talk amongst yourselves. I'm just uh, checking my notes really quickly. Um, yeah, and so I think in the um, I think in the uh, sign of Aries, which is a lot about right this like separating and being like I'm here, I'm doing it. Right. There can also be like a lot of shame in that. Right. And a lot of feelings that are bound up in being like, I am here. Right. And I think that this is part of the um, uh, archetype of Aries is arriving on the scene and needing to take up space and needing sometimes to fight for that space and to like really claim our space. Um, and there can be wounds around belonging. Right. There can be uh, wound, wounds around uh, feeling like we are deserving. Right. Um one of the uh, myths that's associated with Ares is uh, the quest for the Golden Fleece, where Jason uh, arrives on the scene and like gathers up this crew of Argonauts who are the greatest heroes in the ancient world and becomes their captain. And the whole time he's like, what right do I have to lead these people? Like there's Hercule Hercules, there's Orpheus, right? There's Castor and Pollux. There's all of these like great heroic figures. What right do I have to lead them? Right. And there can be a lot of like, I'm not good enough. I don't belong. Right. And um, if we trace these feelings back or trace these thoughts or trace these stories back and um, notice what might be the origin of this. Right. Is this even my story or is this a story that was told to me by a parent right, or a guardian or um, society? Right. Maybe this is an ancestral story that has been like living in my DNA and my blood for centuries. Right. Um, and so I think that we get this opportunity again with Mercury, um, who is like making sense of things to uh, really explore uh, the stories that we're telling ourselves about uh, our experience. Right. Um, 
And, you know, I think, again, this sort of like Aries separating uh, from the whole and individuating as an individual identity in the world, um, like ready to go and make their own way. And Chiron can feel some feelings about this. And there can be scars from that separation, right? And there can also be fear of the uh, future, right? What we are uh, stepping into. And again, whatever like these stories are about like our capacity to handle life on life's terms. And I think one of the things that happens, right, is we get little bits of information and Mercury just pulls all, all of them together into a coherent narrative. And so, um, for example, in my own life, I got a call from my landlord the other day and they were like, your water bill is too high. We want to charge you more money. Right. And <clears throat> I... Uh, I kind of like spiraled out into like, I took that little bit of information and I like spiraled out into, I'm going to get evicted. I've got to uh, put all my stuff in storage. I'm going to be homeless. I've got to just like leave the country <laughs> right from this like little bit of information. Like my Mercury, like made this story of like, I'm going to be destitute and uh, I'm never going to make it and I'm never going to survive. And that for me comes from like some housing insecurity and some core survival wounds, right? Um, and, you know, I'm still like pretty activated about it. And, but having a, an understanding of like, okay, this is a story that I'm telling myself based on little bits of information that it's actually not like, this is not true. I am making something up because I'm afraid, right? And this fear comes from a wounded place. And so what can I do with that? Right. Having that knowledge, what can I do with that? And I think uh, looking at, OK, uh, where is the story coming from? And I think that a lot of times the stories that we are making up come from our negativity bias, which is something that has helped us survive. Right. And our negativity bias is that we pay attention to the things that are bad. Right. We pay attention to the things that are life threatening. We don't pay attention to the good things because the good things are just good. Right. Uh, it is the uh, fear of survival. Right. It is the noticing a, a predator at the watering hole that makes us say, I'm never going to that watering hole ever again because there's predators there. Right. And so we also make up a story with that little bit of information. Right. There is predator at watering hole. Thus, there are always predators at watering hole. Thus, if I go to watering hole, I'm going to die. Thus, I'm never going to that watering hole ever again. Right. And so um, being able to kind of examine the the activated place, right, that uh, these stories are maybe being generated from to keep us safe and seeing if we can, like, bring some soothing and some attention to uh, what is generating that story, that fear that is generating that story, that wound that is generating that story, and looking for... Um, exceptions, right? Exceptions to the story that we've been telling. It's like, oh, nothing ever works out for me, right? That's a story that we could tell. And then slowing that down and looking at, oh, wait, like this kind of worked out for me, right? Well, it didn't work out in the way that I wanted, right? <laughs> okay, well, it did still work out, right? So we can uh, create a little space um, in a narrative and notice, okay, where is that different? Where is that not lining up with it always, right? Where are there exceptions to the story that we're telling? And in those exceptions, how could we tell a different story? And also, um, what is a better story that I would like to tell, right? And for me, instead of the story that like, I'm going to get evicted and I don't have the resources to be able to make it, right? To tell a story that I'm going to be okay and that I've, been okay so far, right? It's gone up and it's gone down, but it, I've been okay. And I have the resources to handle the things that come at me, right? That is a much better story to tell. And even when I'm telling it, I'm like, no, no, right? Like really, there's a part of me that like really doesn't want to embrace that. And I'm now I'm going to have to do some more work around that, which I'm not going to do on camera. So anyway, um, yeah, I just wanted to bring that up because I think that this is a really important opportunity to kind of get in touch with the stories that we're telling about our experience, the stories that are coming from a wounded place. And this gives us a great opportunity to be like, whoa, that was, there's something there, right? And Mercury as the messenger can help us kind of explore that, right? And to explore this with curiosity and with kindness, right? With the child's mind. And also Mercury is the god of crossroads, right? And if we think about 
a crossroads with Chiron, right? Chiron has the opportunity either to go and sulk in their cave and just suffer, right? That is a choice that we can make. Chiron also has the opportunity to take the suffering and transform it or transmute it, right? To use that to um, engage in their healing process and to share this healing process with other people. And I think that we get this opportunity as Mercury crosses back and forth across Chiron and the North Node to make a choice about what path we want to go down. Right. Do we want to go down a path where we're ignoring um, the kind of wounds and um, just sitting in our suffering? Right. Because that sounds easy, but I think in the long run, it's much, much harder. Or do we want to go down a path where we sort of like uh, use that Cardinal Aries energy and uh, listen to that call to adventure and say, yo, I'm going, I'm doing it. Let's do this. Get in, get in. We're changing our lives. Right. Get in. We're on our healing quest. Right. Or whatever that looks like to you. Um, and I think that, again, we are just like offered the opportunity through Mercury to choose a different path. Um, but just having awareness of like what that choice might look like and what path you would like to take and what a better story we might want to tell is. Okay, moving right along. Thursday, March the 21st. We get the Sun in Aries sextile, Pluto in Aquarius at one degree and 42 arc minutes. Um, so again, like the Sun in Aries is like born ready and ready to go, right? Um, they, they're the hero, hero of descending into the underworld and to confront the depths. And I think this uh, sextile with Pluto and Pluto, Lord of the underworld, right? Um, Pluto is also... Uh, sorry, a sextile is a, a supportive aspect. It opens communication. And I think that uh, there is like a free flow of support from like the that heroic energy to that underworld energy. And so, I, again, I think that there's stuff coming up from the underworld, from the unconscious that is helping to inform our hero's journey. And again, this is like um, another way that we can look at the call to adventure, right? Something from the underworld of the system coming up and being like, hey, address me, right? And when we refuse the call, there tends to be more and more and more pressure, right? So I, it would behoove one to uh, accept the call, right? Whatever that looks like. But I think that with the sextile, there's something from the underworld, from the unconscious, from the beneath, right? From the shadow that's like, hey, I'm here, right? And how do we like um, find support from that? How do we work with that? How do we uh, enfold that into our like heroic sense of self, right? How do we not deny that? And what are the ways that um, that kind of underworld uh, call can support us? And if we think about Pluto as the lord of the underworld, they are also lord of all of the wealth in the world, right? All wealth comes from the earth, right? It all comes from Pluto's realm, gold, oil, platinum, plutonium, diamonds, jewels, whatever. This is all like, this all comes from the underworld. And so uh, when Pluto calls, there is a um, opportunity for riches and wealth, right? And the riches and wealth come from the acknowledgement of the underworld and working through the shadow. <laughs> this is how we find the goods, right? And I think that um, we get that support in this moment or this week. It's like, oh, there's something really valuable here, right? And so how do we like listen to the uh, deeper parts of the self um, to uh, really find that like nugget, that golden, uh, whoa, Sorry, I think I get cut off somewhere. Um, how do we like listen to the deeper parts of ourselves to uh, connect in with uh, the wealth and riches that there are in store that live like maybe hidden in the shadows, right? And again, like how can this inform our hero's journey of like, I'm here, I'm doing it, right? I'm Aries, yeehaw! Um, and yeah, Pluto is also a planet of transformation, right? And if we're thinking about this like death and rebirth process that gets activated uh, with the spring, right? Um, this is like 
transformation and like that transformation we can think about this as like being in the earth right this energy that's been sitting dormant in the earth that's been like bubbling and like getting ready to go and then like bursting through the surface and being like emerging right rebirthing right coming out of the underworld back into the light of middle earth into the day world um and this like process of transformation and now that we're here what are we gonna do right and I think that there's something really interesting about uh, when you walk into a room, sort of reading the room, right, before announcing oneself and one's intention, right, maybe reading the room and like noticing what the vibe is. And I think that's um, something to really think about with that Cardinal Aries energy is how do we kind of take the wisdom that we have learned in the underworld or the wisdom that the underworld um, is offering us and the opportunity for transformation that is presented here and how do we integrate that into the way that we show up into the way that we claim space into the way that um, we uh, say I am here right or I am becoming um, and how this is informed with the wisdom from the deep mind not just like this or out there right because I think that there's a lot of context for the heroic in the world um, which is I don't know maybe not appropriate maybe we can trans I mean I don't want to say it's not appropriate but I I think that we can transform um, our idea of the heroic. I think that the world is really in need of new heroes and a new um, identity, a new heroic identity and a new concept of what the hero actually is. Um, and I think that this uh, sextile gives us an opportunity to face some of that shadow material that we live with right and as we are being reborn into the springtime um noticing the shadow that comes with us the old husk that we have uh emerged from right and although we are separating from that in the first decade of aries um also there is like shadow material that is still uh hanging around and cutting something off without integrating it or without processing it um it will still linger with us and fester in some ways and consolidate into like a darker shadow and so how can we you know process the um unprocessable right the things that we have rejected or pushed away because i think these things are kind of showing up and being like yo i'm here right um and there's a lot of power in them um but if we push them away they're gonna hound us they're gonna dog us um yeah i think that's everything that i wanted to say about that uh yeah um so where are we at okay great i got ooh, a couple more transits that uh i'm gonna try and break down pretty quick sorry uh <laughs> May have lingered a moment or two too long on a couple things. But okay, also on Thursday, March the 21st, we are getting Venus conjunct Saturn in Pisces at 12 degrees and 27 minutes. Oh, yeah. Gina Maria says, so tired about wounds around belonging. I uh, feel you. Um, and I think that, you know, it's we can acknowledge and also accept and also say, fuck it. Right? pardon my language but just being like yo i'm here it's gonna be hard to extract me and i'm like this is i'm taking up the space and i'm rooting down into it and like i can claim this you know um so thursday march the 21st uh we have venus conjunct saturn in pisces so uh venus is exalted in pisces right they got their they got it going on there um, they're kind of raised up in uh, this in uh, the Piscean sign that is right before the spring, right? So like um, that kind of a spring energy uh, starting to bubble in Pisces right under the surface. And that like raises up Venus who likes to be social, who likes to be out in the world, right? Who likes to feel good and look good and do nice stuff. So uh, Venus has uh, got a lot of got a lot of mojo going on. Um, uh and uh so they're they're feeling pretty good in pisces sorry i got distracted for a moment um saturn who is uh a curmudgeon right saturn is old and lonely right saturn is like constricting and restricting and limiting um and so in this conjunction uh we can have uh 
you know, feelings of disappointment or feeling increased pressure um, in relationship, right? Or pressure around uh, the things that we love, right? The thing that we love might take up more and more space, right? And take require more and more responsibility, right? There can be the feeling of like, um, yeah, there can be the feeling of loneliness when Venus uh, conjuncts Saturn because Saturn's like, no one loves me. Venus is like, I love you. And Saturn's like, no, don't love me. I don't want to be loved, <laughs> right? <clears throat> and I think Saturn can actually get really threatened by uh, Venus's appreciation of connection and closeness and affection, right? Venus's uh, sort of... Um, I don't know, joy of life, I think, is uh, kind of threatening to Saturn, uh, who wants to just be like cold and lonely and wants to like sulk and be like grumpy. Right. Um, and I think that uh, the Saturn archetype holds these kind of boundaries and these structures and this restriction <laughs> because they're afraid of intimacy. And Venus, with all of this power in their exaltation, is like, it's okay. And Saturn's like, no, it's not. It'll never be okay. And um, I think that there's a level of vulnerability that we're, that Venus asks for, right? Um, vulnerability and intimacy that is really threatening to Saturn. So it can bring these kind of like Saturnian um, barriers and borders online. Um, these Saturnian structures uh, get activated around this. Um, so that's something to pay attention to. We can also feel like senses of constriction in relationship or in love or like people are too close, right? Or love is choking, right? Can feel, uh, yeah, increased pressure um, to uh, show up for the things that we love, uh, for our responsibilities. And <clears throat> also it can bring up feelings of being unloved, right? That no one will ever love me, right? Um, Saturn is a lot about pressure and weight, Right. And I think ideally this pressure um, helps us to de decipher what is actually valuable to us, what we actually love, what we what actually brings us joy. And this is the gift of Saturn is it's that pressure and that constriction that kind of forces things into their um, most kind of authentic place. And this is a short transit. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is a short transit collectively, right? So this is going to happen for a couple of days because it's going to be activated during uh, the eclipse. Um, and Venus is the ruler of the eclipse. So, you know, it's got like some, it's got some legs to it, but, you know, it's different um, if you're getting like uh, transiting Saturn to your natal Venus. Um, but I think that there is a piece around uh, values, right? I see Venus as being really connected to our value system. And Saturn um, applies this pressure uh, to really help us notice, like, what are my values, right? Am I living by my values? Um, am I, you know, how are my actions, words and deeds aligned with my value system and like what might need to shift? Um, because, you know, it is the choices that we make when we're under pressure that really expose who we are, right? Expo exposes our true value system. And like, you know, we might say, I value this, I value that, this is important to me, but under pressure and under like, um, uh, uh mounting pressure it is the choices that we make and how do they line up with what we say that really exposes our core value system and i think that saturn's relationship with venus gives us an opportunity to sort of view that and to tune into like what is my value system right and how am i actually honoring my value system um when the pressure is on right and another thing about this transit uh is that uh Saturn is structure, right? Is scaffold, is bones, is skin, right? And so thinking about what are the our relational structures, right? What are the structures uh, that we have created or can create to bring more joy and Venusian pleasure into our life? You know, do we take a day off, right? Do we take time to honor Venus? Are we making sacrifices um, of things in our life to be able to bring in joy and pleasure and Venusian things? Right. And this is something that this transit can bring up. Also, Saturn is boundaries. Right. And boundaries are really important in relationship and boundaries are really important in love. Right. And boundaries are really important in pleasure and joy. And it is our no that helps us to have a really good yes. 
right? And I think that in this relationship, um, ideally Saturn is helping Venus strengthen her boundaries. And there's like this communication where Saturn is like, you know, you don't have to say yes to that. We're like, if that's not aligned with your value system, you can just cut that off, right? And Venus is like, whoa, I never knew that, right? And Venus in Pisces is like, yeah, I want to like feel everything, right? And Saturn's like, do you actually want to feel everything, right? What, you know, what if we set up these boundaries and like structures around like how you want to feel, when you want to feel those things, um, what would be like ideal scenarios to feel things in, right? What would be the ideal feelings to have? And so I think it's really important to like work with both of these archetypes um, to for help us help us to have good boundaries so we can feel more of the things that we want to feel, right? And we can feel more joy in our life. And to take time, Saturn also rules time, take time to feel more joy and experience joy. Oh, nice. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Mary says, loving this conversation. It's literally going on in my head most days. Um, yeah, I've been reading your thoughts and that's why I'm doing this. <laughs> um, so, okay. I'm about out of time, um, but I just want to bring in uh, two more things and maybe I'll touch back on them next week um, in our next talk, uh, which happens every Monday at 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time, 11 a.m. Mountain time. Um, but uh, Friday, March 22nd, we got Mars entering into Pisces. Uh, that'll be going down until April the 30th when they move into Aries, sign of their rulership. Um, and, you know, Mars as ruling the first decan of Aries and also the sign of Aries where the sun is entering into and sort of like spring is springing at. Um, I think Mars moving into Pisces, kind of like Jupiter rules sign, mellows things out a little bit. I like to think about Mars and Pisces as sort of a spiritual warrior who is on their uh, spiritual quest, right, um, which can, you know, uh, be a great thing it could also look like a somebody who's very dogmatic right or is willing to like give their life for the cause or be a crusader um but you know on the upside i think being in a jupiter ruled sign um provides a little ease and a little bit more spaciousness for mars than being in uh aquarius uh which is a saturn ruled sign which is a little bit more restrictive and constrictive and like more stuff to fight in there and Mars in uh, Aquarius is either fighting for the humanitarian needs of the collective or is rebelling against the collective and uh, telling them, uh, don't tell me what to do. I'm going to do it my way. Um, but, you know, what I what I like to think is that Mars in Pisces um, will uh, provide a little bit more spaciousness, a little bit more ease and maybe like a little bit more um, uh, emotionality to uh, this Aries season. Um, Mars being the ruler of Aries. And then on Saturday, March the 24th, we have Venus and Pisces sextiling Jupiter in Taurus at 15 degrees and 49 arc minutes. And so uh, this is really nice. Um, Venus is exalted in Jupiter's sign of Pisces. Jupiter is in uh, Venus's sign of Taurus. So we got mutual reception here. They are in a communicative aspect, right? So they are supporting each other. They are uh, forming a sextile, which is like, you know, uh, two-way communication. Venus is like, this is the thing that I like. And Jupiter's like, I'll buy that for you, right? So um, coming into this weekend, uh, as we've been going through like all of this, like separating and acting, actioning and, um, you know, uh, fighting to belong and like wounds around belong longing and like oh me oh my right coming into the weekend we get like a little bit more support this nice supportive aspect from uh venus and jupiter like helping us um as we come off of this conjunction of venus to saturn helping us to have good boundaries uh then we can use those boundaries and our newly um defined value system to really appreciate the joy in life over the weekend and then on monday we get an eclipse so uh i'll be talking about that next monday um, and, uh, yeah, that is all the astro weather that is fit to print, my friends. Uh, be sure, be sure to tune in each and every week, uh, to, uh, your weekly astro weather forecast. Um, I do this on the Astro Star Live app, which is a, uh, oh, thank you, Jess. I'm glad you appreciated it. Um, I, 
Astro Star Live is a great astrology app um, that uh, has a bunch of great astrologers who are doing great work on it. Thank you, Lily, um, including myself, uh, Tara Tall, Cameron Allen, um, I don't know, Sam Reynolds, Michael Bartlett, uh, Lauren K. Hickman. There are a bunch of folks um, who are up there dropping knowledge on a regular basis. Um, and yeah, I do this every week. I do other talks on there. There are other astrologers doing great talks on there. Um, you can also get readings through it. Uh, sometimes I'm available for readings. Uh, other astrologers I know, I know are, um, there is a link. If you're watching this on Instagram, there is a link in my stories. And also, uh, my man Lincoln bio has a link for you to sign up and to follow me. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, I'll throw a link in the show notes. And if you're watching this on Astro Star Live, thank you very much for uh, being here. I really appreciate you. Um, and I appreciate all of you. Thanks for tuning in and spending your Monday morning into afternoon with me, uh, getting your weekly dose of the astro weather. Um, heads up, I also have a astrology-themed radio show that comes out on SoundCloud. Um, every Saturday and it comes out on my Patreon every Friday um, where I basically do this but instead of me talking I play music and then I tell you uh, how the songs that I played relates to what's going down in space and uh, if you're interested in checking that out um, I believe there is a link in my stories I'm also on SoundCloud at Camp Wizard Camp um, and I think uh, that's that um, last bit of exciting news. Uh, I'm going to be teaching a class starting in May with Sarah Janes. Uh, Sarah Janes is a uh, mythologist and dreamer. Um, and this is going to be an eight part class going over mythology and how uh, mythologies relate to dreams, how dreams are personal myth and uh, myths are collective dreams. And we're going to have guest speakers and uh, PowerPoint lecture exercises and uh, um, some, uh, I don't know, uh, guided meditation and stuff like that so um I, oh thank you lily i oh, appreciate you um so uh, i just want to let y'all know about that i'll be having uh links in my stories and making posts about that in the not so distant future so if you're interested in uh, mythology and dreaming uh tune in to whatever i'm doing uh for more information all right. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. I will take just a minute or two more in case people have questions. Um, but yeah, um, I appreciate you. I hope that this was helpful. And I wish you all a beautiful week in space. Bye, Lily. Nice to see you.